Uh, greetings, everybody. I'm Larry Williams, the director of Karma, the Consortium for the Advancement of Research Methods and Analysis at the Rawls College of Business at Texas Tech University. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to another Karma Quick Chat. Uh, as you know, may know, our Quick Chats are where we take the opportunity to uh, chat a little bit uh, with people who are presenting uh, for Karma so that we can learn a little bit more about their backgrounds as well as get a preview of what they're going to be talking about. And so today it's our pleasure to be speaking with a one of our webcast presenters. You may know that during the course of the year, Karma offers a series of webcast lectures by distinguished methodologists worldwide who speak on a topic of their expertise and often passion. Uh, and then members of our institutional membership program have access to those live webcast events as well as their recordings. And you can find all kinds of information about all of our programs uh, on our website. So today, uh, it is my pleasure to be chatting with our webcast presenter, who will be speaking on February 16th, uh, John Antonakis from the University of Lausanne. And uh, so, John, we really appreciate you taking the time uh, to chat with us this morning, as well as uh, to give your webcast lecture in a couple of weeks. So, uh, John, and we are thankful. I think you've been involved with CARMA in different ways in the past, and we appreciate that. And we're very excited to uh, have you give a webcast lecture here. So I kind of like to begin with uh, this chat uh, by finding out how you got interested in a career of research. Uh, one of the pleasures of being able to talk and meet so many different people is that so many of us end up doing the same thing, but basically coming at it from very different histories. So how did you get involved with it all in the beginning? Thanks, uh, Larry. Firstly, for the introduction and uh, for this, uh, for what you do, I think it's an, an amazing public service and and helps um, uh, bring uh, research methods, democratizes them, and and makes them more accessible to people all over the world. So, well done for uh, the organization you run and for the commitment that you've shown to um, advancing uh, the the state um, of of science in our field, which 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 <laughs> needs needs a bit of help. So, uh, yeah, how did I get into this? Uh, it's um it's an interesting uh, um question, and and my response is going to be a bit long winded because uh, when I finished school, um, I majored in um, what was called natural sciences. So we had to specialize in in some topics, and mine was, was in physics, maths, and chemistry, and and history. Um, and I didn't know what to study. And one of my best friends uh, decided to study a uh, Bachelor of Economic Sciences. So I thought I would just uh, go, go and study economics. So uh, that's where I began. But uh, my studies were cut short after a year because I, um, I, I had to um, do the military service in South Africa. And I, I didn't want to do it at that time. So um, I left and um, came to Switzerland. And... Uh, did a few things here and there, but uh, finally uh, found myself in the U.S. and um, it was in law school where, uh, so I, I switched uh, back to doing a business degree and and I met my then future wife who said to me that, um, you know, if we wanted to stay longer together, maybe I should do a master's degree. <laughs> I didn't even know what a master's degree was at that time, but, uh, you know, I decided to apply and I got a scholarship and I stayed on. Um, and then... You know, one thing led to the next. Uh, she came from a family of very distinguished uh, medical researchers, an uncle at Harvard doing maths, and her, her dad was a, an oncologist a researcher. She, you know, and, and I, I, you know, I heard about research and all that. And, and um, at, at one point in time, I, I went back from the business world, um, uh, uh, back into academia. I was teaching at a private college, and then I got really interested in um, the psychology of leadership. Until that time, I, I thought management was all about optimization and reducing lead time. So I had a very mathematical um, view on, on how to teach management. But then um, I got very interested in psychology and then went back to grad school and, uh, and then um, got, got a degree in, a, in applied management and decision sciences. I was focusing at the time on psychometrics. 
And then my advisors uh, suggested that um, I should uh, perhaps consider a career as a, as a professor. Um, at that time, I didn't really think um, that I had I had it in me to do that, but I applied for a few postdoc positions so I could kind of legitimize my background, which was all over the place. Uh -huh. And then I was very fortunate to get a postdoc at uh, in the psychology department of Yale University. Um, and then after that, um, there was a position that was open at the University of Lausanne in OB, Organizational Behavior, and I took it. And then how I got to teach uh, statistics and methods, that's another story. If you'd like, I can tell you about that. That you, you know, that great. I'm always interested because so many of us, what we find is there's so many of us that uh, start out really being driven by substantive interest. There, there are things that happen that kind of push us or nudge us into pursuing those interests in methods. So yes, how did that happen with you? So I, I was teaching leadership in OB, and um, when I got tenured in 2000 and I think five or six somewhere there. Um, I was I was the chair of the management department, and I remember uh, there was a there was a guy in accounting and and some other department, and, and we were talking about sharing um, student evaluations, and and he said something like, you know, you guys who teach uh, OB and leadership, you know, you sing kumbaya and make students cry, and and so you get high ratings. Try teaching something with numbers, and then you'll see how difficult it is to get good student ratings. And um, at that time, I, I, I actually started doing experimental um, research and we needed to build a lab. And um, I, uh, I had put in a budget to the dean's office so we could start building a behavioral lab and someone had to teach experimental stats. So I offered myself to do it. I wasn't at all scared of, uh -huh. of numbers and, and, um, and you know, it comes quite, quite easy to me. So, so I, teach, I teach a class in experimental methods and statistics, and um, <laughs> I get higher ratings teaching that than I do teaching OB and leadership. So the director of the PhD program saw this and called me in and said, hey, you know, we, we have a real problem with the, um, the PhD level stats class. You know, students really, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they find it challenging and they're not interested. How about you teach it? It seems you have a knack for teaching uh, methods. And stats, huh? and I said, no, no, I said, no, no, I mean, there's not my training. He goes, yeah, but you know, you did, you studied psychometrics and, and you're very good in stats and you seem to be able to convey the points uh, um, to students very well. So I taught the, a class at that time, we called it structural equation modeling and advanced regression. And it went extremely well. Um, and then um, I, I just felt like an imposter for the first two, three years. So what I started doing was started doing research on, on methods. And um, I wrote a paper that went on to be quite influential um, titled On Making Causal Claims, a Review and Recommendations. And then I rolled out um, some, 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 some papers with my students, others with, I work a lot with Miko uh, Ronko, uh, Ronko in Finnish. Um, and and I don't know, about one third of my work now is actually on applied stats, econometrics or, or methods. Uh -huh. And um, so this course is now called Causal Analysis and, uh, and I'm very happy to teach it. I also work with econometricians. So now I, I don't feel like an imposter anymore now that I'm doing research on the topic. So, but in the beginning, I felt very uncomfortable doing it. Uh, but, uh, but I do teach the class in an intuitive way. Um, and we get to the point where we teach also students how to do Monte Carlo simulations um, so they can understand the properties of anything uh, without necessarily knowing how to solve the um, analytical, you know, intractable, intractable analytical problems. Yeah. Well, your, your experience with teaching sort of parallels mine. Thankfully, when it happened with me where I got to teach uh, more methods and quant courses, I kind of felt like uh, I had found what I was meant to do, and it came much more naturally than teaching substance. And I think probably like what you were describing, I've always felt that if whatever effectiveness I might have begins with the fact that I see the world through a substantive researcher's eyes uh, and can use that to explain the stat or the method issue, and then know enough to backfill with the math to add to that explanation. Whereas a lot of people that start out with only quantitative training, they kind of present the equations to their students and expect those equations to be self 
the meaning, their meaning to be self-evident in the same way. And it's just not uh, that particular way. So I'm thank I'm happy for you like me that we found something that we feel good about and and also like uh, the having it be a stimulus uh, for your research is a great thing as well. So all of uh, that uh, you mentioned the the twenty I think the twenty ten paper the, the LPU paper on uh, assumptions causal analysis. Um, you've been very successful and you've been very heavily involved in, in the publication process, uh, both as, an, as a reviewer, as an author, and as an editor. Uh, and there certainly are a lot of things uh, that are going on these days. So from your view, what are some of the important challenges we're facing and are we facing them adequately? Yeah, that's a very good question, um, Larry. Uh, I think for me, um, and, and ever since I started teaching uh, methods and getting um, involved in, in questioning how we, we do things, um, I think at the end of the day, what we really should care about is, is can our research inform either basic research, in other words, build, create building blocks so that others can put them together and build cohesive theories of, of how the world works, or if we can inform policy, in other words, tell managers, you know, do more of X and, and you will get more of uh, Y. So I, I take a lot of inspiration from the medical sciences and how they work. And um, in the medical sciences, you know, they, they're very, very careful about um, informing policy only once they've nailed how a variable is causally related to another one. And I think in our field, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people come from experimental psychology. They understand what randomization means. They understand that by randomizing, we hold, um, we distribute the threats um, um, equally uh, across the treatments. Um, so there's, there's nothing that correlates with the exogenous variable that could explain the relationship with why. Yet, um, they, they learn this, and then when they do observational research, they throw out the assumptions uh, that ANOVA or regression makes. The assumption is that the disturbance is orthogonal or uncorrelated to X. And the problem is with observational research, as you know, is that um, omitted causes of Y may correlate with the variable that we measure. And then we go ahead and estimate a model. We find that X predicts Y, and then... Um, the researcher makes um, claims about uh, the supposed causal relationship. Sometimes they, you know, will put some caveats and limitations. Yet the whole theory is set up in a causal way, and the whole conclusion. Um, so I think I've done now four or five uh, review papers, maybe five. Um, I'll count them as we go, go through it. So the the the, the 2010 paper, we took a random sample of of papers from top top journals, AMJ, JP, JOM. Um, OBHTP, personnel psych, and LQ, and found that, um, you know, a, a large majority, up to 90% of the papers made, you know, up to three or four um, um, cardinal errors that that rendered estimates, um, un, uh, you know, uh, confounded and uninterpretable. Um, we repeated this in another exercise, what makes articles highly cited. We found that 80% of papers that we reviewed um, had what was what we called endogeneity problems. In other words, problems of confounding. Uh, we did another paper in Journal of Management where we looked at process models, in other words, mediation models. Uh, again, we found over 90% either did not have an exogenous cause that started off the process, or if they did, they didn't use the proper estimator to, to, um, to uh, estimate the model. So that's four papers, uh, three papers. Uh, we did an ORM paper uh, recently on... Um, on uh, the violation of the random uh, uh, assumption, um, the, the um, orthogonality assumption in random effects models. And again, we found that about 80% of articles that use hierarchical linear modeling actually don't show that they don't violate the assumption that the, that the, the, the fixed effect, in other words, the, the, the common shock is uncorrelated with the regressors. So the problem is, um, is that the, the majority of the research that's put out, even in top journals, um, 
makes causal claims, but unfortunately doesn't back them up by the design conditions um, and estimation procedures um, uh, that they should be using. So, so this is really where, where I've been trying to focus my efforts on um, is to is to try to make people get back on the straight and narrow and and to, to do careful research in that area. So uh, when I became editor of LQ, um, that was really an important point for me. Um, it's not that I didn't accept correlational research. I did. Um, mm -hmm. I published myself, but but when it's correlational, we got to make it as such. We got to say it's an association. We don't know what's driving that association. Um, but we shouldn't um, uh, oversell what, what we do. So um, there's a lot more now research in LQ that's published that uses uh, natural experiments where you know some exogenous shock is generated by nature or by some unexpected event um, using uh, different kinds of estimation techniques like regression discontinuity, difference in differences models, um, and a lot more experimental research, both laboratory and uh, in the field. Um, so, so that's really where I was trying to push the, the research so that it becomes more policy relevant. And, um, you know, it seems like the journal, um, you know, we had we had more submissions. Our impact factor went up. I didn't care about that. Uh, you know, the last thing I cared about was the impact factor. I cared about quality, quality, quality. But, you know, as we chased quality, I think success found its way to us. Yeah. Well, and uh, uh, you certainly... Uh, your impact is carried through with uh, the efforts now of George Banks, uh, one of who is one of my students back at Virginia Commonwealth and is a dear friend. You know, it kind of reminds me, I think when you, of, of, you can subsume the various things that you mentioned about the threats and the problems. Uh, there's a phrase that I use in talking about model evaluation, SEM model evaluation, but I think it applies in this phrase is what you don't see is more important than what you see. And I think exactly. that anything that you can use to heighten researchers' attentiveness to uh, the things that aren't in the boxes, the things that are that are at the end of the arrows, uh, that's a great thing. And I was heavily influenced in this direction by my dear friend, Larry James, who in 1980 wrote the, the, the paper on the unmeasured variables problem in path analysis. And so I think I've been sensitive to it, but uh, there's a lot of people uh, that are not. So have yeah, I, I, I was just looking up for my Cook and Campbell book. I think it's at my oh, office. Yeah. But Cook and Campbell have been saying this, they have said this forever. And the book, you're talking about a book by James Mulaik and, and Brett. Brett. Yep. Causal Analysis. Um, so yeah. that book also, um, I think, um, said what needed to have been said. The problem is that it just didn't somehow seep through to those who do observational research. And it's just very unfortunate. So it's not like we are, you know, discovered something new. Um, uh, you know, it's just making more obvious what is is has been uh, somehow um, ignored. Yeah, yeah. Well, as we were talking earlier about uh, accumulating years, I can look behind my camera and I have Campbell and Stanley, Cook and Campbell, and then Shaddish, Cook and Campbell. Cook all, and Campbell, yeah. Yeah, throughout all, uh -huh. of, I've not, I've moved so many times and I've lost so many things, but somehow I've been able to keep track of those. Well, so as you have grown during this this period that we're talking about, uh, how do you think that's influenced you as a researcher? Or let's talk about as a writer, right? So your experience as an editor, when you sit down to approach writing one of your own papers, how do you think you look at that now that's different as a result of the editorial experience that you've had? Mm, yeah, that's a difficult question. I think I've evolved gradually. Um, so I, I, I don't think there's been like a like a shock after I became editor. Oh. I, I think it's been gradual. Um, and I think now whenever I sit down to write a paper, my, my first question is, will it make a difference? Um, you know, how can I help to extend the boundaries of knowledge? Um, and I... I think I'm much more careful than I used to be about what effort I go to um, to discover something. So, you know, it's it's okay to 
and, and LQ, for example, we, we accept replications, um, which I think are super important. I think null results are super important. Um, registered reports, um, uh, there was, a, there was a, a study recently done by Bricker and uh, Fabiola Gerpot um, that showed uh, LQ is like the number one management and applied psych journal in terms of publishing registered reports. So, you know, I, I think it's really important on one hand that we truly understand what's going on and, and we need to be able to replicate and reproduce results. So I think the hallmark of, of, of science and, and the medical sciences is one and physics is, is reproduce and replicate. Unfortunately, in our field, you know, you get top journals saying, you know, what's new here and, you know, what's the theory here, you know, and that really annoys me. So, you know, I, I try I try to kind of look at, at things and, and justify why we got to do a paper, whether it means, you know, knocking down an existing theory or understanding if a theory uh, that has been presented in the past actually works or not. Um, and then at the same time, it's trying to move the needle somehow by kind of bringing in um, some some econometrics into um, our field, or or even originally from from psychology. I mean, um, you know, Thistlewaite and and Campbell invented the regression discontinuity design. Ironically, it came out of psychology, completely ignored in psychology, um, hijacked not hijacked. I mean, uh, let's say embraced by the economists and who who really understand this technique really really well. Um, yet it's now making back inroads into the the management domain. So um, I I when I sit down to write something, I really try to to see if I can perhaps translate a method in a way that's more e interesting to understand. And then the second thing is probably to understand a phenomenon that that is very complex and puzzling, like charisma, for example. I wouldn't have been able to un understood and unraveled charisma and you know, we have a new definition for it. And we really, I think we moved the field away from measuring charisma with questionnaires and, and measuring what we call um, charismatic leadership tactics. So uh, verbal or nonverbal signaling techniques that users use, uh, that leaders use or to randomize it. So I, I was really adamant about, you know, trying to understand what charisma is by by using the the various method that are methods I've also promulgated. So, you know, I had to rely on on very clever experimental designs where where we don't have unfair comparisons. You know, uh, you know, what do you compare charismatic speech to? Um, you know, charismatic speech is like a like a medicine. You know, you can't compare it to a real crappy speech. That would be like comparing it to a poison. And if you find a treatment effect, is it because charisma doesn't work and the poison like uh -huh. kills more people? Or that they both kill, but the poison kills more. Or that this does nothing and this helps. Or this helps, this helps. You, know, you have no idea where the treatment effect is going. So, you know, what's an appropriate baseline condition? And, and what's an appropriate comparison treatment? Um, and so, you know, all these things informed how I should study um, charisma uh, in a more robust way. Uh, so much so now that I've also developed with electrical engineers what we call a charismometer. Uh -huh. So we trained a deep neural network to code charisma automatically from from text. So so this is now going into the realm of of mixed methods. And um, you know, in in the old days, people thought, well, you know, there's no ways computers can um, extract higher level semantic meanings and symbols from text. They they can if you train them properly, and they do the job very reliably. Um, so you know, I think also the next thing. Is is maybe I, I might get involved is 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 in qualitative methods because I think there's a lot to be done there. Um, I think quant methods are, are held to to a, a higher standard of science in so far as replicability and reliability and transparency and open science is concerned. And I think we 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 should be able also to uh, to to pass on those standards while research. But but let's first get quant research in order, and then uh, then uh, I'll see. I'll leave that for the last ten years of my career. <laughs> Well, yeah, I um, and I certainly echo uh, and agree with your belief that ultimately both quantitative and qualitative methods uh, can really are both going to be necessary to understand the kind of complex, complex phenomena uh, that we're talking about. And that's why uh, with Carmel, we've always uh, been uh, uh, committed to both sides of it. As I indicated at the beginning, John, uh, we're here chatting because of your webcast. 
Uh, maybe we should close. Can you give us a preview of what you're going to be talking about on uh, February the 16th at noon Eastern, or no, at uh, 9 a.m. Eastern time? Can you give us a preview? Yes, absolutely. So I will actually talk a little bit about, about charisma and why it should be studied by randomizing um, observers to treatment and why measuring charisma as an independent variable by questionnaires um, will will make it very, very difficult to entangle the causal um, relationships. So I will show how we can demonstrate this problem by controlling the information environment. We're actually going to expose observers to a treatment. Then we're going to solicit their ratings, what they see, and then we're going to make them do a costly outcome. Then what we're going to do is we're going to throw away the treatment and just pretend it wasn't there. Because in the real world, um, people rate leaders on the basis of what they see. But what they see is tainted by many things, uh, whether the person is handsome, a man, is smart, is extroverted, whether they know that the leader has been high performing or not. So they use all these variables to evaluate the target person on charisma. So, for example, if I ask you to rate your boss and you know your boss has been effective for whatever reason, could be due to him or some other reason, um, that effectiveness, that performance signal will affect how much charisma a person will see in the speech. Uh, so we've done experiments on that too, where you you know, you know split the person in two, they, they see the same speech, half the people are given a positive performance signal, the other half a negative. It's got nothing to do with what you see in the speech. Uh -huh. But you know, just like when people hear that a wine is expensive, they taste the same wine like a minute apart, they taste the expensive wine as better. So what I'm going to show is that is that evaluative judgments of leadership and by implication on many other organizational phenomena are severely biased by these hidden variables that you said. You know, am I responding and rating that person high on charisma because they're intelligent or because they're actually behaving charismatic? Or is it because they're handsome? Or is it because I know they're, you know, there's so many variables that if they're not measured, you cannot dis you can't disentangle the rating from these omitted variables. So I'm gonna demonstrate that experimentally. Um, it's a paper that's in press right now. Um, what I'm gonna show you is actually not in the paper. We use the paper for some other, uh, um, for, we, we have some other little gems that we demonstrate. So this is gonna be something new and it will perhaps uh, fire some warning shots about why we should be very, very careful about what we measure and how we measure it. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, John, it's been great uh, catching up with you. I appreciate you sharing so much about uh, your background, the evolution of interest. Congratulations for all of your success with LQ and as an author. We're very excited for your webcast on uh, February 16th.